Welcome to the third episode of our uh, lecture series on the new world order, which is essentially based on uh, a book that I'm working on with a working title, The Global West versus The Global East, or How the Global South Will Decide the New World Disorder. Um, thank you for your comments uh, to the first episode, second episode, and please keep them coming. Uh, this is very much an interactive uh, process, and remember to follow our YouTube channel as well. Now, this lecture is about the uh, second, first, sorry, first part of the book, in other words, the order of power. And it has three chapters in it, and this first chapter I have called from order to disorder. It's essentially an historic overview of how order changed uh, after the end of the Cold War up to uh, the war in Ukraine. And as always, uh, I begin with a little anecdote and I'll read it out to you as well as then the prologue um, that uh, ends uh, the chapter. In between, I'll tell you the story of uh, the chapter itself. So here we go. Here is the anecdote. January 1990, Furman University, Greenville, South Carolina. I'm a young student of political science, taking my first class in international relations. Professor Don Gordon is explaining the significance of the fall of the Berlin Wall. We are living history, he says. Something big is going on. The old order is dying, but a new one is yet to be born. I follow the developments through the New York Times, The Economist, and the International Health Tribune. This is, mind you, the time before internet. My dad faxes me news from Finland. The world looks different on the old continent, more tense. My country is going through a tough transition. The Soviet Union is unstable, about to collapse. I'm worried and excited at the same time. I try to understand what's going on. The bipolar cold world seems so neat and orderly. What will this disruption mean for Finland, for Europe and the world? I read everything I can get my hands on. I'm in the library from morning to evening. I learn about European integration from Professor Brent Nelson. I'm hooked or perhaps more like obsessed. Will this disruption lead to order or disorder? So that's the anecdote that kicks off uh, the chapter. And after that, uh, let's go through some of the basic ideas in this chapter. This time it has uh, six points in it. <clears throat> Here we go. Point number four, one is what I call in search for order. So, you know, I've always been the type of a person who's trying to understand, you know, what's going on. And my brain seems to work in such a way that I have to try to find an orderly way of looking at it. Of course, life is much more messy than probably my head allows me to admit, but nevertheless. So I say a couple of words in this first part about the Roman Empire, which was about an order, the Ottoman Empire, the Qing Dynasty, and then actually the British Empire, which was the first global empire. The other ones, you could argue, were quite regional. I also explain in uh, this first chapter that I'm basing my thinking very much uh, on the nation state, which in many ways emerged uh, from the peace of Westphalia in 1648. I also explain that the Cold War was bipolar and ideological, uh, but uh, it still had multilateral institutions to contain uh, the big powers in the form of the Soviet Union and the United States. There were rules, and I also feel, and I say this um, in the first part, that during the post-Cold War period, there was also a set of rules that we stuck to. Point number two, the 1990s. So this is where I go into the sort of, um, uh, you know, 
the, 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 the sequential uh, or the chronological uh, way of, of, of sussing out uh, order and how we move to disorder. So the 1990s, Western order and disorder. There was in the early 1990s this, this sort of unipolar uh, moment, this, this sort of, you know, end of history uh, type of a, a, a moment. That, that we all believed in. And also this feeling that, hey, we're doing this together. Remember, uh, the UN Security Council uh, basically condemned and took action against uh, Saddam Hussein when he attacked Kuwait uh, in uh, the Gulf War in, in the 19, early 1990s. So there was this unipolar moment, end of history, but it was still, you know, quite messy. The war in Yugoslavia in, in Europe. But at the same time, the multilateral institutions were trying to renew themselves. The OSSE became the OSCE. Uh, NATO enlarged, the EU enlarged, the WTO changed its name from GATT uh, to the WTO. The IMF, the World Bank tried to uh, change. But you know, my argument here is that these were all very Western changes. So if the old world, world order ended, and if there was a unipolar moment, it ended up being quite Western. So it was sort of changed in the image uh, of the West, because everyone thought that, you know, Western values would win at the end of the day. The third part of uh, chapter one is the 2000s. So starting from 2000, and I call it sliding towards disorder. And my argument here is that this slide sort of started with 9-11, so the attack on the Twin Towers. Uh, and this was pretty much an attack on both freedom uh, and democracy. And it should have rung the alarm bells of uh, the West in understanding that not necessarily everyone wants to live the type of a life uh, that we were uh, promoting. Uh, globalization started to have headwinds. Um, the United States began focusing on the war on terrorism rather than uh, promoting uh, democracy. It was very much the era of the rise of the rest or the beginning of a post-American world. We started new, seeing new players coming in. Jim O'Neill, an economist at Goldman Sachs, talked about the BRICS, so Brazil, Russia, uh, uh, India, China and South uh, Africa. At the same time, there were wars in Afghanistan. There was a war in Iraq. Uh, there were terrorist organizations which were non-state like Al-Qaeda or uh, the Taliban. Um, we're starting to see the beginning of the disruption of the Western capitalist system with the um, bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers and the subsequent financial crisis. Uh, we saw the disruption of the international order with Russian, Russia violating international norms and rules by attacking Georgia in 2008. The EU is looking quite messy. Uh, you know, it's trying to do institutional change, but its uh, constitution collapses uh, and is voted against in both France uh, and the Netherlands. So this sort of bubbling, sliding towards disorder there wasn't a unipolar moment anymore. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, we're starting to see the world becoming more multipolar. And of course, China is going from strength to strength, while the West is, is looking quite weak, and Russia is looking strong geopolitically after uh, the attack on, on, on Georgia. The fourth part of it is about the 2010s. I call this the decade of crisis and disorder. Uh, some people have called it the polycrisis. Um, so it, it's, for me, a crisis of democracy, of capitalism and of globalization simultaneously, because there is this sense that these three don't uh, deliver. From the European perspective, we have the euro crisis. I was very much uh, involved in that uh, myself. There is the asylum crisis in the summer of 2015. Um, populism is on the rise in European uh, democracies. Uh, in 2016, we get uh, the referendum on Brexit. Uh, 
and the election of a new president in the United States, Donald Trump. Uh, so things in the global West are not looking, how would I say, to put it mildly, very stable. They're actually looking quite uh, unstable. Then, of course, you add on to that, uh, you know, the, the sort of early 2020s, when we get uh, COVID, we see China emerging, the BRICS being quite strong, we see new partnership being, uh, being crafted all around the world. So this sort of crisis and disorder ends with uh, the beginning of the war uh, in Ukraine or Russia's attack. And then we kind of get three simultaneous crises hitting us. One is COVID, two is the war in Ukraine, and three uh, is an energy crisis. Now, my argument here uh, is that, um, I come to my fifth point here, is that to look at this purely from a Western lens is too narrow. And I admit, you know, I, I quite often do this, but here we go. I think the West made two mistakes uh, in the early post-Cold War era. First, it was too focused and preoccupied with itself. I guess this is very natural. I mean, the Cold War ends, you know, the EU uh, thinks, what is it going to do next? It starts to enlarge, it starts to do institutional change. There's the war in Yugoslavia. You know, people are sort of looking out for themselves and see what could be done. The second mistake that they did was to assume that the rest of the world would follow the West. And this basically didn't happen. So China copied capitalism, but it blocked democracy, right? So it used the instruments of globalization and free trade, but it said, listen, we're not going to follow the model of democracy uh, and you know, freedom. Uh, Africa started to look at China because it took less of a moral high ground, unlike Europe. So China started to provide the hardware to Africa in infrastructure and finance um, and, and roads and bridges, etc. Whereas Europe was sort of not only taking the moral high ground, but provided the software in terms of, uh, you know, education and, and perhaps to a certain extent, uh, technology. The West was not very, how would I say, consistent in its view. Uh, the war in Yugoslavia, the bombings of Sarajevo, Afghanistan, Iraq, the Israel-Palestine conflict, you know, working with countries in the Middle East or the Gulf region. So there wasn't that much focus on, okay, let's do the democracy thing. It was more, we're doing the interest thing rather than the values. Then we get the Arab Spring and there's this feeling that, yeah, you know, technology is gonna change the rest of the world but it doesn't really happen. We get changes in a handful of countries, but there isn't this wave of, you know, democratic change. You, of course, add on to that uh, the war in Syria, uh, the Gulf focused on uh, energy rather than uh, democracy, and then you start seeing, you know, key players moving in different types of directions, Turkey, India, uh, Brazil in, in Latin America. So I think to look at things purely from a Western perspective, it, it just gives too narrow of a view and, and we in the West have to get out of that uh, mindset. Now, my sixth and final point here in, in, in chapter one is to say that uh, uh, the 24th of February is the end of the post-Cold War uh, era. Uh, the new one has not yet been sort of uh, defined, but it's, it's a question of how we frame it. And I come back to what I said in the introduction that this is the 1918, 1945 or 1989 moment of our generation. We can get it wrong, we can get it right, or we can get it more or less wrong or right. Now, the problem is the framing of the debate. I, I think the West makes a mistake in trying to frame this into autocracy, versus democracy or democracy versus autocracy. You know, the meetings that US President uh, Joe Biden has held. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, the Global East, 
sees this and it's framing this uh, as the end of the global West and the end of Western hege hegemony. That's why, it talks, that's why it talks all the time about, you know, uh, 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 a multipolar world and it's, it's sort of establishing projects and processes with the rest of the world which have very little to do with the so-called liberal uh, world uh, order. Now, the Global South, again, it's focused on agency and policy. So it, it, it's not focused on you know, democracy versus autocracy. It's saying that, listen, we want to say in this new world order, which I think is fair, uh, and on top of that, it's saying we are interested in policy. We want you know, uh, economics, we want development, uh, we want finance, we want infrastructure, we want to work on, on technology. So that's why I keep on arguing that it's the global south that's going to decide, uh, you know, in the direction in which the pendulum is going to swing. Uh, in this part, I also go back to the thesis that it's going to be a decade of competition, conflict and cooperation. And I think a lot of players are jostling for power. So there's these power vacuums that are emerging and it's going to, you know, take a decade to basically frame this uh, century. And here's where I then, in this chapter one, come to uh, my uh, final bit, um, or postscript as I call it, uh, and I go back to um, the, the, the sort of prologue uh, of the chapter, and I, I say the following. I sometimes wonder what I would have written in an essay in the winter of 1990 in Professor Don Gordon's uh, class on international relations, if the question had been, describe the world order 30 years from now. I guess the starting point would have been a strong belief in Fukuyama's end of history thesis, a belief that a rules-based world order with a liberal twist would win the day. Idealistic? Mm, perhaps. But what else could one expect from a young student from a development democracy in Scandinavia? Naive? Mm, not really. It's only real realistic to believe that political entities would want to work towards an optimal society. What I fail to see and often understand is that all cultures and histories are different and that interests often Trump values. What I also failed to understand was that the ideological victory of the West went without global celebration. Many countries just saw it as an extension of the past they had hoped to leave behind. Perhaps I just wanted to believe that the release of Nelson Mandela would be our long walk to freedom. But alas, it was not. An era has ended and a new one is yet to be born. So this is how I frame the first chapter. I look at how we moved from order to disorder in the 1990s, in the 2000s, in the 2010s, and then the situation that we are in right now. All this before we go into chapter two and have a closer look at the reactions on Russia's attack on Ukraine, which in my mind is basically going to define also the direction in which the world order might take. And it certainly should make the global West understand what is going on. But for that, thank you very much for keeping your comments coming. Next, we move on to chapter two.